Tom, Peggy, I'm good. How are you both? We're doing well. We're, we we got to get off our conversation of belly buttons. Yeah, we were talking about something stupid. Oh, uh, goodness. I, yeah, oh, I don't, yeah. I, I don't know oh, why yeah. we went there. But, Mike, we actually, I think for the first time, I know for me, I don't know, Peg, how how, how you feel about it, but like, I think for the first time, knowing that the Bears uh, rookies are reporting a week from today, I, I've got kind of a football buzz for the first time in, the, in a long time. Well, I'm certainly looking looking forward to it. Um, I, I am. I was in touch with uh, the, the person I see, a physical therapist here uh, in, in, in greater Washington, D.C., actually has a couple of uh, Bears players as clients and uh, or as one-time clients and um, when they were in college out here. And, you know, I sort of keep up, you know, nice young guys who are excited about the season. And it's just like, wow, you know, this is coming. I don't know that I'm going to watch Hard Knocks and go. I don't know that I'm going to go about it that way. Maybe it'll be irresistible. You both, and not to mention Sylvie, too, who I make fun of me because I'm, I'm, I'm prone to not watch it. But with, with, with the Cubs and White Sox being completely um, irrelevant and the Bulls being irrelevant for now probably the next three or four years, I, you know, I mean, in the Blackhawks, they're going to be irrelevant, but with a plan right. for the next couple of years, we're over. I mean, I'm waiting for Northwestern and Bears football. That's what I got. That's, that's, that's what I got. So I thought um, we had you convinced that, that Hard Knocks was going to be entertaining this year because of some of the storylines i know i know but then i go back I, after i get off the phone with you guys i'm like okay i'm not doing this <laughs> yeah right and then you know it's it's gonna peggy it's gonna take a lot of convincing for me to go hard knocks i don't know see i'm i have not watched it in a couple of years and i i want to see behind the scenes because i want to see we'll be able to tell how much they control which is going to be 99 percent of it yeah you know it yeah and and, and the storylines are not you know you for those of us who are journalists or were journalists you know when the storylines are already planted by the team you kind of yep. go eh, yeah. you know that's yep. it's not a natural storyline I, I'm still curious to see the machinations of this team. And I'm, in a weird way, Michael, I am uh, really a little obsessed with who is Matt Eberflus. Yeah. Fair. Like, I want to wow. see, is wow. he, has he really kind of changed his image? And, and what right. is his relationship with the players? Because last year when he was hanging by a string, they did not turn on him, and I, I just look and I go, wow. Oh, yeah, what that, that is seemed it? to mean something to a couple of coaches I talked to, um, former coaches who said, hey, this matters, and here's why you got to pay attention. And I, I, you know, you know, I never played football at any level that matters. I listen when I, when the, the ex coaches that I certainly get counseled on these matters about. And I hear you. I he's like eighth though on my fascination list. Like, I'm certainly with the offensive coordinator. I want to know more about. I want to see how he operates. Obviously, you know, the, the players sort of, you know, I, I have some sense of Caleb Williams more than most people who are going to follow the Bears this year. Um, but what's Roma Dunze like? What's, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are some of the young veterans like? Uh, Montez Sweat, who's from, who's here, who's, you know, guy, he's nice. He's a Georgia kid, but he's got history in the DMV. Uh, and people really love him here and loved him with his old team. What's, you know, what's his role going to be? Um, I know that he is like obsessively working to be that, that great defensive player that has, you know, always been a part of bears historically. So I, there are players I have lined up in front of Eberflus, but now you, you got me thinking. Uh, Mike, before the, the, I mean, look, the, the rookies don't even report, until a week from today so that we still have okay. some time but what are what what is with with that in mind what would you consider to be a successful 2024 campaign um i want to see them get better over this like like i don't want to see a three and one start dissipate and just be disappointing and you know injuries and poor performances and not living up to billing i'd rather see it go the other way if you're getting off to a slow start and then coming on, you know, so, Tommy, you know I'm a 
historian, um, and I care about the history of franchises and the history of things that maybe happened before I was paying attention. I, I, I've been fascinated. Um, as I got older, I got lucky enough to know, get to know Gale Sayers and Dick Buckets. And when I was a young, young sports writer, one of the people I covered was George Allen, and which just makes me so old now. And I, that brings me to the 1965 Bears that drafted Gale Sayers and Dick Butkus, third and fourth overall. And I get, and they already had Mike Ditka, and they already had other All Pros, and I'm, 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 I was so obsessed a couple of times in my life with why that team and George Hallis coaching, why that team never made the playoffs. How's that possible? And, you know, back then, you know, rookies just didn't start and George and George Hallis was not going to start Peyton. I'm Peyton was not going to start Sayers and Butkus. And they got off to a really slow start and he put them in the lineup and they went something like, and Tommy, you were in that building. There must've been some holdovers, when you first got in that building, I mean, hell, Ditka was one of them. Yeah. To what happened with that team? They went like seven and one in a fourteen-game season to end the season. They were the most feared team in the league, but they didn't make the playoffs because you only got one team. Like the Bears were in the Western Conference or whatever it was, and George Allen, I guess, was the defensive coordinator, and so he would tell stories about how great those players were, and there was nothing to show for it because they didn't even get in the playoffs. All right. And so I'm, I'm like, okay, suppose that, as I tie it to now, there was such anticipation when I was a little kid over those teams and those players, Hall of Famers. Um, suppose they got off to that kind of start and rushed to the finish and didn't get in. Like, how would I feel about that? Or would I be accepting of a 1-5 and five start or 0-5 oh or whatever it was, and then they put on a rush and they got, they got to be great by the end of the year? Would I – how would I feel about that? And I think I feel great about it because more teams get to the playoffs than if not this year, next year. And it's like, don't be myopic about this. I don't want to be that fan. So I know that's a long explanation, but. Sounds like you're cautiously optimistic. Yes, I'm trying to be cautious. I am. I'm trying to be cautious because um, these are, you know, these are players that everybody seems to respect. And the Bears seem to have really done this the right way. Very thoughtful, very pragmatic. The execution that has to take place to go into something like that has been both flawless and fortunate. You know, you want a Dunze sitting there with that pick and not having come off the board. So yeah, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, but probably, you know, over my skis optimistic, just like most of Chicago do. And that's what the – it seems like the national audience thinks that Chicago's over their skis as well and that we, we're not being realistic. I think – listen, I think two, two three wins, that's a, that's a great improvement. And everyone gets so excited looking at what C.J. Stroud did last year and what the Jaguars did a couple of years ago. And I, I just – I'm – a little bit more reserved. Uh, that's, that's reasonable, Peggy. So you're looking at if, if we got the seven wins. What did the Bears win last year? Seven. I, I, I don't even seven. remember. Seven. So, so I, I, I picked right, them so for nine. I, I picked them for nine. If they go nine, though, then we're going to be crazy because they got a shot unless they turn it on late. And that's what I'm saying. You know, they could get to nine wins by being, you know, three and seven. And then, you know, getting a stride. Like, what's reasonable to expect? What's what's reasonable? What like what what performances are we going to be accepting of? I uh, see. I are think, we going to oh, you know I if Caleb goes late? Yeah. You, you guys all think he's going to be bad, that they're going to be better late? I don't know. I yeah, but I I'm looking at their schedule thinking, I don't I don't think all that much of it. Like the the hard part of the schedule is at the end because the division yes. is packed in at the end. Like I don't Tennessee. I don't know. I mean Tennessee's like the Bears. It's sort of starting over. I'm not quite sure what to think of that. But they should be um, better. If, if, if they are who we think they can be, they should be a better football right. team in the second half versus the first half, regardless of what they're, the, the level of the competition. Because you, especially on offense, you've got a lot of continuity on defense. But in offense, look at the new faces in that house. Starts with the quarterback, center, uh, one of your, two of your receivers, 
um, you know, yeah. your running back. Yeah. Like, they're just going to – it'll take a little bit of time for everybody to learn each other's, you know, tendencies. Well, Tommy, so. there's a voice of reason because basically – the whole world now judges results like a football season, which is every time somebody loses a game in any sport, even when the last 162 games, people will lose their minds because we, we, we judge, we live, the, we live an NFL life. The ups and downs are completely out of control and unrealistic. And, and I think, but too, we, I, go ahead. No, that we treat rosters like NBA rosters. Yeah where somebody's supposed to be Victor Wimbanyama out of the gate. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we don't have realistic um, expectations which fit the culture we're assessing. I you know, an NFL season is not an NBA season. It, it, there's a different flow to it, and there should be. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny, too. And, look, we always, we always talk about the trenches until – we want to talk about the trenches, and, and that's an area of weakness on both sides of the football team for me. So that's why I have a little more caution than See, others. But, yeah. hey, uh, be, I know I want, we want to talk basketball with you, too. I want to get your thoughts on, on the direction of this Bulls team and, and the, the, you know, the departure of DeMar DeRozan. <laughs> I also, though, Mike, want to get your take on this NFL Sunday ticket case. And I don't know how much you and Tony have talked about it. Not at all. You I'm haven't. Not even, I'm not even so sure I'm okay. aware. Um, What's well, going on with it? Well, the, the, the NFL was found liable of violating the antitrust oh, laws. Oh, yes, 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 yes. No, I'm familiar with that because I'm expecting a check. Right. As a guy who, as a guy who, who chopped down trees yes. at his townhouse, you know, and I did it, I, 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 to be honest, I did it for two reasons. I did it so I could see every game Michael Jordan played once he came back. <laughs> And that was so I had I've had direct TV since 1994. I had it. I just got rid of it. And I did it so I could see the Bears every week, so I could get Sunday ticket. That's why I did it. Well, they lost the. And so initial... I had it longer than anybody. I had it 30 damn years. Yeah, the league lost the initial part of this case. They're appealing it right. now. The the league right. is, but there is a potential if in fact it goes the distance and goes in the other direction of the nfl and the plaintiffs yeah. do their 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 cases is, is and then there's trouble damages because it's an antitrust case Ooh. yeah there is a potential that each nfl owner could be on the hook for 450 million dollars and if yeah. you haven't followed it maybe it's unfair of me to ask you the question because but but i my, my thought was and peggy and i were talking about it how does that affect a lot of stuff with regard to different NFL franchises. Because yeah, it I, depends on the franchise and how deep the pockets of that owner is. I followed it up to the point, Tommy, I didn't know it was 450 yeah. potentially each. Yeah. I followed it up to the point where I could stand and cheer and say, somebody send me a check. The <laughs> NFL usually loses these cases. Yes. The history of the NFL is not littered with courtroom victories. And... Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, for a franchise is, like the Bears that I don't believe is is overly liquid because you know the football is right. their thing, right. and a a family that is looking to build a stadium uh, again. Uh, there's a long way to go before the final resolution yeah. occurs, but it yeah. is something I would keep an eye on if you're a football fan and just kind of see how it would affect your favorite football franchise, but. That's right. That's right. And different different ways. Look, we've seen um, in, in basketball, we've seen the sale of these teams. Why? Because it's smart. Because if you're whether you're Michael Jordan or Mark Cuban or um, who just sold the team? Uh, who put the team? Oh, well, the Celtics oh, put their, um, the Wick the Celtics, Ross back. Just each put one, yeah. Wick, well, Wick is 63 years old. Yeah. Mark, I know, is 65 because he's my, we're the same age. And Michael's 61. So if you're those guys and your investment is going to go 10 times and you sell it, and that's what we're talking about in those first couple of cases, at least. So, and you, you're talking about turning, I don't know, just, you know, you're talking about turning 200 and 200 million dollars into 2 billion, you know, or something like that. I don't know what gross specs, I don't even know what his initial investment was. 350 you, million was his initial, his group's okay, initial so investment. You, so, you know, out of that, out of whatever the Celtics are said to be worth, five and a half billion or six billion, he's going to get 350, 
I mean, so he's going to get like $3.5 billion. Right. So I think we're going to see the sale of more teams, more franchises, and not just in the NBA. Because the NFL franchises are worth even more in some cases. Yes. Um, the yield may not be quite as much because the groups are larger. But I, I, I don't know what it means for, e- for each franchise. I mean, how many – and maybe it won't just be the direct TV case that um, forces – hands of owners but maybe it'll be more than that maybe people are just of an age where they're going to say you know what it's time to do something else well, i got I'm, I'm 60 years old i don't want to just work and stress 70 hours a week over this stupid team when i can have three billion dollars in right, my pocket right. which is the nfl the only major league sports uh league in in the United States that does not allow private equity investment firms and sovereign wealth mm-hmm. funds to invest in their teams. That could not change. Yet. That <laughs> could change. Right. If this yes, goes through, Peggy, this could it change. It almost has to change, it, yes. right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Oh my God. It ha- I, I've been, you know, when everybody was going crazy over the Saudi tour and golf, I started asking people, I'm sorry, how long before the before every sports league in this country is saying yes to Saudi investment. Yes. They're talking? in soccer. They're in wrestling. They're in, uh, you know, yes. uh, auto I've racing. I've been told they're in, yeah, they're, they're in some places, by the way, relatively secretly and low profile yes. that people don't even talk about. Yes. And I've been told a couple of places they're in, and I, I'm not going to mention now because I, I haven't confirmed it. I don't have my reporter's hat on. I heard it from reliable sources, and I'm like, oh, my God. Yes. And so, I just, I, I yes, think it's, it's, it's a, all going to change. Yeah. yeah, it's a conversation that deserves longer time than we have. But I just wonder, yeah. you know, yeah. it's something I think it's something that's flying under the radar for a lot of people. Yep. And maybe ultimately yep. it won't be as big a deal as it potentially could be. But mm. 500 million, even for NFL owners, is still an enormous right. amount of right. money that that's would right. change the that's direction right. of how you do business. All right. Uh, yes. se- segue to basketball. Uh, DeMar DeRozan is no longer a bull. Yeah. Just kind of your yeah. overall thoughts on where this team is and what they've done. Well, they should have done all this stuff before the trade deadline. They should have recognized in January that they were getting not what they needed to get out of Levine, DeRozan, Caruso, you know, um, and they should have made these deals at the deadline when they would have gotten more. All the reporting is that the draft picks would have been much better picks than they, than they ultimately got. So if that's the case, and by the way, we talked about this briefly, Tommy, not only do I not mind Josh Giddy, I'm intrigued by him, right. but, but you know, if they could have gotten a first and a second, do you prefer that as opposed to the Giddy was like a six overall. So maybe, you, maybe, you know, what they got is fine. And especially if Giddy's developed, but they're now undertaking the complete rebuild that some of us were talking about. Like, if you're going to make this move, then you should have started stashing these picks because the picks they got, they don't enable you to move around the map like Oklahoma City or the Knicks just did or some of the other franchises that, come, that stockpiled picks. This isn't what you would call a haul of picks no. that enable you to go after distressed assets. Um, or in a year that you think the draft is particularly strong to move into it and get three picks instead of one. It doesn't, it does they don't, it doesn't do that. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, it just seems like they're, they're, they're still in the middle of nowhere. They're not going to be any good. No. I mean, do I like the, the kid they got from the Pacers, the center, do I like him sort of? Yeah. But isn't the goal not to be good this year? Because this draft class is one that where you, if you do, yeah. if you can right. maintain. Top 10. Yeah. Yeah. It is the goal. I just. I, I hate to say it. It's, it, you know, I mean, it ain't going to be fun. I'm a little skeptical. But. I'm a little skeptical. I just, you know, you know, everybody's going crazy. I, okay. If we're going to talk about basketball. You can't. You're going to talk about the Bulls and where we're going the next couple of years. You're going to talk about Cooper Flag, and I can't think of the other kid who's going to do the 7-2 African kid who's supposed to be just as good, if not better, long-term. You can't talk about that without thinking back. I mean, I remember the dream team, 
the real dream team, the only dream team. This is not a dream team. Anybody who calls it a dream team should be suspended <laughs> uh, at least for a week. Uh, it's the U.S. Olympic basketball team. And I don't know how good they're going to be. Um, so that team lost a scrimmage to Bobby Hurley and I think Chris Webber. I don't know if Grant Hill was on that team. Um, they lost. A, they lost to a team of Hall of Famers even though Bobby Hurley did not become that. And people lost their minds. People lost their minds because this Cooper flag game was is reminiscent to me of this Bobby Hurley situation. I was standing outside of the gym, you know, 32 years ago when it happened. And there was a guy named Jordan who said to me, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, I don't know. I was going to, like, just take a day off and stay. No, you don't want to do that. Why not? Because we're going to kill them tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He goes, they're not going to score at all. <laughs> and I said, you, you can't be serious. They, you can't shut them out. And you know, Peggy, you know, you know, you know what this is like. You were there in the locker room. You know, many, you've had many conversations with Michael. Yeah. When I said, when I said to him, what are you talking about? You can't shut them out. The look was if there was he had put a hole in my chest <laughs> and or between my eyes more accurately and I I I immediately changed my tune I just go okay I, yeah, I'm there <laughs> I'm there I'll be there tomorrow and you know the score was something like 21 to 1 I don't know what the score was anymore I, I don't remember but I just remember at one point they could not even get the ball across midcourt because what's different. And people say, is this team going to be like that team? Hell no. Cause this team doesn't have, you know, <laughs> murderers. And I'm saying that in the kindest of course, possible yes. way, of course. like that mm -hmm. team, like when people said to Charles, what do you know about Angola? And he said, I don't know much, but I know Angola's in trouble. That, like, that, you know, just having Larry Bird on the, on one leg and Magic and Michael and Charles and John Stockton, who was a quiet murderer and nobody ever knew it. Like, they decided this other team with these same guys who won the previous day, they were never going to score again in their lives. Jordan held it against those guys for years, years. I know, because I would go to games. He goes, Weber, he's great. I love Chris Weber. What? No. Mm -mm. I remember. Remember four years ago. No. You're like, oh, my God. Mm. <laughs> this is so, so, so I don't know what Cooper Flagg's dominance yesterday means. Because I don't know if these guys have what it takes to take it to Cooper Flagg the next day. They don't even schedule. They can't even do it. So I'm skeptical. Yes, I'm the old man saying, get off my lawn. So, like, are Steph Curry and Kevin Durant and LeBron, and are they going to do that? Are they going to say, the next time we see Cooper flag, we're going to cut his legs off? Because that's what the dream team was like. Throw Carl Malone in there, okay? There weren't all that many nice guys on that team. Patrick Ewing is was, David Robinson is, was, Chris Mullen is, was. Like, everybody else was murderous. So I don't know what it means that Cooper – like, I'm not judging Cooper Flag and whether the Bulls should start tanking tomorrow for Cooper Flag based on what happened yesterday. I'm the last guy. Okay. I get it. Uh, all right, there's plenty more to be done for this Chicago Bulls team, but uh, we can get Ooh. that at a later Ooh. time. Yeah. Uh, just continue to Ooh. keep your uh, football radar up. It's going to start sometime very when soon. Does, uh, when does the HBO thing start? The first Tuesday of August. Oh, Peggy's got that commitment yeah. to memory already. Uh, well, you know, I, I I did put it on the calendar because I figured everyone's going to be talking about it yes. here, so we we have to be aware. You guys are going to have, yeah, you're going to have to. And the question is, is it more entertaining for me to actually watch and give in, or just rail against it and boycott it? I don't know yet. I haven't figured it out. I think you'll watch it. Uh, thank you, Mike, for your time. Good to talk <laughs> to you. Be well. Have a good rest of your All right, week. You guys. Bye, be Michael. Safe. Take care. All right.
Michael Wilbon, always a treat to talk to. By the way, the White Sox game has been postponed. Yeah. Uh, they're going to have a straight doubleheader tomorrow that will begin at 110, and that means we get an opportunity to talk to Black and Abdallah tonight in Crosstalk, and they will have a full ride tonight as well. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Absolutely. Now, the weather's uh, continuing to, to rain. It's going to do this all night long. It doesn't look like it has gotten horrible just yet. No. But it's coming. It's going to affect your commute home.